Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. <clears throat> Jesus said, For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, he who had two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not winnow. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant! You knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I have not winnowed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. <clears throat> so take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has been, who has more, will be given. And he who has abund will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word has come to us. The word of warning and correction, or a word drawing us to you to reflect upon your gifts. Lord, help us to hear this word and see not only law, but your good news, the gospel of your Son, calling us to use the gifts you have bestowed upon us, O Lord, according to your will and for your purpose. Give us strength and guide us by your Spirit, O Lord, to do these things and not be hearers only, but doers also, hearers of your word. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> if you go into Genesis, a little question to begin, off, to begin our text here for today, kind of set the scene for us. The very first command God ever gives humanity Right there in Genesis 1, and very often we don't even ref think of, reflect on this in terms of command, right? <clears throat> but it's right there, the very first command God gives humanity. Anybody know that one? Be fruitful and multiply. Very good, Carl, that's right. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, we like, usually don't think of that, you know, uh, as a command. You know, we, we, oftentimes, you know, see that as an invitation, you know? You know, the birds and the bees aside, uh, that whole issue aside, however, the reality is that God is inviting us to be fruitful with all that he has given to us. You know, I, I mentioned that because everything we have and everything that we are is a gift from God. 
And I I think that's really kind of at the core of our gospel text for today. But on top of that, our gospel text, and and I don't know, you you probably picked up on the fact, there's a little hint of judgment in here this, this day. Yeah, oh yeah, just a little hint there. You know, you got to know when, when they're culling through those last, uh, uh, those last prophets, you know, the, all the names start to s- sound the same and they all end with A-H, I-A-H. You know you're in trouble, right? Because now they're turning up the heat on us. And, and in reality, that's where we're at right now. As we are, as the ball is rolling toward Advent, we know what that word means, Jesus is coming. You know, and we get all excited because, you know, I mean, uh, somebody, I saw on Facebook page the other day, somebody had the Christmas tree up in the hotel they were already staying in. And, and, you know, the Christmas lights are up and all the music is playing and Walmart and the malls. Santa, Santa is in the mall already. And that, shouldn't that be illegal? But it's there. So we get excited. We know Advent is around the corner and Jesus is coming. Yes. Jesus is coming. You know, we, we, when we think of Christmas, we think of the little cute baby in the manger and we're all excited. And, and we forget about the other part about Jesus coming. The accountability part that God invites us to reflect on. We see a lot of law and gospel in our texts for today. I mean, there's the law, right? Be fruitful and multiply. And of course, there are issues and pointed out in the gospel of St. Matthew, that whole idea of being fruitful. In fact, that's really kind of a line throughout in both the the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. You know, the idea that, that Israel was called to bear fruit. You know, after, you know God, after the Tower of Babel, you know, looking forward to that one, I bet. That's a good text. After the Tower of Babel is when we have the story of Abraham. And he's gone through the Noah thing. You know, the, you know the, the hitting, the, hitting the, uh, the world reset button and didn't exactly do what perhaps he was hoping would accomplish. And the Tower of Babel just presents itself as the fact that sin is just this thing that just won't go away. So God sets himself up with a people that will be a light to the nations. In fact, indeed, uh, the prophet Isaiah makes that point. The prophet Jeremiah makes that point. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, Isaiah writes, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the tree. What I gave them has passed away. And that's the challenge really throughout the Old Testament. The, the people of God, the people of Israel, are supposed to be a light to the nations. They are consecrated, set apart for that purpose. He talks about that right there. He's consecrated a people for that purpose. But the problem is, they understood their consecration as being separated from the world rather than giving as a gift to the world, as a light to the nations. And of course, uh, throughout the Old Testament, we understand that there is challenges. There's challenges of even staying, even staying uh, faithful to, to the one true God. Instead, substituting the one God for gods of man's own making. Idolatry. So, obviously, the challenge is that Israel isn't bearing fruit. I mean, Jesus himself has come to call Israel to repentance. First, John the Baptist calls them. Hey, how yellow that line. He's gathering the people, the Pharisees, the, the, the religious leaders have come out of Jerusalem and they're gathering around him at the River Jordan. <clears throat> And he looks at them and he says, you brood of vipers. Who called you? Who who told you to come and repent? To be baptized. But indeed, that's the gift. That they are given the opportunity through him. He tells them, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Because they hadn't exactly been what God had called them to be. And Jesus comes and essentially says the same thing. He's Calling people to, to repentance, to bear fruit. I mean, here it is. God's word made flesh is among them. Inviting them to repent and turn back to God. Jesus comes across a 
fig tree. Of course, chapter 21 of, of Matthew's gospel. And he looks at the fig tree and there's no figs on it. So he curses the tree. The, you know, there's a, really what's going on here in many ways is kind of a, uh, a, a judgment. And we can look at Jesus in this terms as a prophet. And much in the same way as Zephaniah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. An enacted prophecy in many ways. If you cannot be the light to the nations, we will connect the world. So that I am the light to the nations. And those who will follow after me will bear the light that I give them. And they will call the whole world to repentance and back to God. The law is certainly there, but there's also gospel. I mean, clearly what we see in our Matthew, in our gospel text, and it's really, if you expand it out, understanding Matthew chapter 24 and 25 together, is Jesus' final discourse, because in chapter 26 we, we begin to see the passion narrative in Matthew's gospel. But in chapter 24 and 25, the, the, the idea of what would come after Jesus had been crucified died, risen, and ascended to, to God's right hand. What next? And Jesus is preparing them. You know, in the beginning of chapter 24, somebody's looking at the temple saying, how wonderful, how amazing. And, the, and Jesus says, eh, it's going to come down in three days. And he's right. It all happened just as Jesus had told them it would. And then he began to talk about the close of the age. And, and people started listening a little carefully. Oh, really, Jesus, tell us about the signs of that time. We can see the signs of that time around us. The reality is that Jesus is coming. But there's the good news. It's Jesus that's coming. The one who gave himself, who used the, the fruits that God had given him. The word and his will. His sacrifice on the cross to save the world. He gave and used those fruits. He did the will of the Father. Gave of himself. Absolutely and completely. And called we his followers to do the exact same thing. Last week in our text of course we see the, 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 the parable of the bridesmaids. The ten, the five wise and the five foolish. And inviting the, all of us to keep oil in our lamps. To be ready at all times. For the bridegroom to return. And so this week is kind of the second half, another parable where Jesus is inviting us to stop and take a moment and, and be, be prepared. Understanding that Jesus comes as just and righteous judge, calling us to account for all the gifts and graces that God has entrusted to us. Now, now to be sure, we understand Christ has come and died for us and for our salvation. That is a gift. We respond to that with our own stewardship. That's our response to God's love, to God's grace as clearly revealed in Christ, crucified, died, and risen. We know that day will come when Christ will call us to account. If we look at our text for today, at very beginning, the master, who of course is a, allegorically speaking God, we know that God has indeed given us everything. And God, in this case, the master in the parable, delivers to them great talents. Now, in this case, we want to be very clear. The word talent here doesn't mean to us in the English what it meant in Jesus' day. Actually, what a talent was was an enormous, when I say enormous, I'm talking, you know, Steve, I mean, uh, uh, Bill Gates Grant kind of size money, right? Now I'm talking, you know, millions, if not billions of dollars. So we get the sense of lavishness here. I mean, that's a key point, I really do believe, in part of understanding this particular text. Especially when we get to trying to, to parse out what it is the, the last of the three servants is saying. Because a talent is a pretty big sum of money. So the, the first, the first uh, servant gets five talents. It's like five million dollars. Here, go do something with this. Imagine if, if somebody came up to you one day and said, here's a billion dollars. 
fix the world. Now, I don't know if you could fix the world with a billion dollars, but you'd have an awful lot of fun trying. The reality is that's exactly what this story is, is asking. It's, it's inviting us to reflect on. First man takes it, and he understands that command of God to be fruitful and multiply. And he is. He takes the, the talents, and he comes back with five talents more. And the same thing with the second servant. He must, he's not given quite as much, but his return, he is fruitful with the gifts God has given him. And in all of this accounting, the third one comes. You're a hard man. You reap where you do not sow. You gather where you do not winnow. I don't know about you guys, but as I read that, I'm going, was he missing something? The generosity of the master in the story is overwhelming. That's why it's kind of, we don't understand the, the absolute enormous sum of money. Even one talent would be overwhelming. And he hides the money. Afraid. I mean, really? Afraid? If you were afraid, I mean, obviously the, the response of the masters, wouldn't you have at least have given it to the bankers so they could have had some sort of interest on their return? I mean, granted, interest these days isn't what it used to be. But it still would be something. God is looking, uh, requesting, inviting us to, to, to respond to his generosity. And we will be held accountable for what it is that God has given us. That's our, our stewardship. It's our response. We've been given a lot, including the very first thing we are given, the gift of life. When we think of stewardship, automatically our minds turn to, to money and, and financial resources. But the reality is, God has given us so much more. Not all of us have accumulated wealth. But all of us have a talent to offer to the mission of God. And so we get the gift to return back to God what he has given us, ourselves, our time, our talents. And the good news is that we hear this word that calls us to reflect and even perhaps uh, uh, repent for our use of the resources of God. Jesus calls us to follow in his footsteps, to pick up our own crosses and follow him. He gave himself to us completely. And he invites us to give ourselves. And we are saved by God's grace through faith. But the reality is you can have the faith of the biggest thing. But if you, if you have faith to move a mountain, but if you have not love. God invites us to love our neighbor by sharing ourselves, emptying ourselves. Paul talks about it in those terms. And so we can use the gifts that God has. We can bear the gifts, the, the fruits of the Spirit. And of course, the first fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about. A fruit of love. To give ourselves to others. Peace. To share that which Christ has given us with others. Joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Patience. Yes, yes. Goodness gracious. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes my tree is a little on the parsed side. But to be honest, we look to God's Spirit to give us these fruits. They don't come from us. They come from Him. So we pray that prayer. Come Holy Spirit. Kindle in us the fire of your love so that we may share ourselves with others. And it does it, it's not just through the church. We do that in many places, in our workplaces, in our school, with the relationships that we have. We share that love, that peace, that joy, the patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. That is what we are called to be as the body of Christ and to share that with others. And so we do it here. We go to places like Hastings and, and share food. We have angel trees that we can share the gifts God has given us at Christmas time. 
so that others may know that Christ is coming. And that is a, a moment of joy and celebration. We go to Peru because that's what Christ called us to, to go out from, from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our invitation. That's our gift. God has given us everything we have need of. St. Peter says that. Everything we have need of for, for, for life and holiness. And it is to that which we have been called. It is that which we have been gifted for. And it is that to which we will be given an account. The good news is, yes, we will fall short. Again, the gift is that Christ is the judge. We play, we pray that every day. When we gather together, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We pray that and asking him to fill us with the desire to share ourselves at every time and every place. Because we are the body of Christ. In our baptisms, we have received that light. And Matthew tells us we are to let our light shine, not hide it under a bushel basket, saving it for ourselves or, or friends or family, but no, to let that light shine before the whole world so that the world may see God's glory and give him thanks and praise. So we pray that. As we move out into this season and in this week and in every season and every week, Lord, show us the way. Help us be your servants. Help us to be faithful and share the gifts you have given us, emptying ourselves to be fruitful and multiply the joys that we have found in his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we gather, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on God's word and his will for our lives.